told that um, you, you've never had a lawyer speak to, to the group. Not, so. not that we know of. Right. So I, I wanted to begin just with a couple lawyer jokes. There's an ongoing dispute. <laughs> What, what's black and brown and looks good on an attorney? A, a Doberman pincher. <laughs> Here's a couple others. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so please feel free to interrupt or ask questions without waiting till the end. So, so I'm going to speak tonight about fair use under copyright law and um, digital rights management efforts and how they can compromise uh, fair use while trying to re reduce copyright infringement. Um, I'm going to quickly give a background on, on uh, copyrights and, and copyright law because I think it's important to understanding the, uh, what, what fair use is. Um, copyright is a form of protection provided by United States law to the authors of so-called original works of authorship that, that can include literary, musical, dramatic, artistic, and certain other intellectual works, whether published or unpublished. For, by example, software programs are considered literary uh, works. The, the work must be fixed in a tangible form of expression, even if not obvious, so long as it may be transmitted or communicated with the aid of a machine, such as a computer or a, or a cell phone. Examples of material that can't be copyrighted uh, would include works that aren't fixed in a, in a tangible medium, such as um, improvisational speeches or performances that haven't been written or, or recorded. Lists or tables from public documents or other common sources, ideas, procedures, methods, or processes. Th there's a pretty low uh, barrier for what's considered originality for purposes of being copyrightable. There, there was a leading case of a, of a new um, phone book uh, and, and the person trying to claim a copyright said that, well, I put it in alphabetical order. Uh, that, was, that, was not, that, that didn't meet the standard, but the court said that it didn't take much more than that. A copyright owner has some exclusive rights that go with holding the copyright. The, the right to reproduce the work, to prepare derivatives from the work, to distribute copies or, or records of the work. Phono records for this purpose includes any, uh, any uh, recorded uh, medium of, of music. In the case of literary, musical, dramatic or, or film, the, right to per, the exclusive right to perform the work publicly, also the exclusive right to display the work publicly, and, and if it's a sound recording, to, to, perf, to play that, that recording publicly. Copyright can be claimed by the author, the original author, or someone that's been authorized by the author, such as under a work for hire agreement or, or a publisher. Ownership of a book, a painting, or, or another copy of the work does not typically uh, include copyrights. So, so if somebody buys a piece of art, uh, they, they don't get the copyright to that. Unless, unless they've specifically acquired it. Publication, publication under copyright law is important because it triggers a deposit requirement with the copyright office. You, you have a copyright, an author has a copyright without, without uh, making a deposit with, with the copyright office, but the advantage of 
registering it is you can seek what's called statutory damages against against infringers. That that's a specified amount of damages uh, that that is not necessarily related to the actual damages. In order to in order to uh, put the world on notice of a copyright, th there's a particular notice requirement. It has three elements, uh, the circled C, or the word copyright, the year of the first publication of the work, and, and the name of the owner. And if it's, if it's music, if it's a, a record or, or another recording, it's the same form of notice, but instead of a circled C, it's a circled P. The, the statutory damage level is between seven hundred and fifty and thirty thousand dollars per per infringed work. That's not per copy. That's that's per work. That range is at the discretion of the court. If it's willful infringement, the the damages can be up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The the burden is on the uh, is on the alleged infringer. If if the notice was was properly on the work the notice of the copyright, then, then the burden is on the infringer. And there's a presumption that it was not an innocent infringement. So you, you have that ability to, uh, to seek that larger amount of, of damages. Fair use is a concept under copyright law which um, has been developed over the years. The, the, uh, the law in this country has, has two sources. The, uh, Law is developed by, by court cases that, that's referred to as, as common law or case law, and then and then there's so-called statutory law when it's when it's uh, laws that are that are adopted by the legislature. A lot of uh, uh, laws developed through through the common law through court decisions, and then they were eventually incorporated into into statutory law. That's that's what's happened with uh, with fair use. Uh, fair use is a is a concept which says that that list of exclusive rights that I went through that accrues to a copyright holder there there's a limitation on those exclusive rights for uh, for fair use Th these are some quotes from some very old cases that talk about the uh, the public policy behind fair use it's it's primarily to uh, promote creativity and, and research and education, as, as well as uh, criticism uh, and, and reviews of, of prior works. While I shall think myself bound to secure every man in the enjoyment of his copyright, one must not put manacles upon science. In the, in the, um, in the 1976 Copyright Act, the uh, the fair use that was developed in, in the case law was, was finally uh, incorporated into, in, into statutory law. And, and this, is the, this is the fair use provision. Notwithstanding the exclusive rights under that prior section, fair use of a copyright is not a copyright infringement. So, it, so it's, a, it's a limit on, on the exclusive rights that a copyright holder typically has. Are you going to, I noticed at the bottom of the previous page, you had the reference to the Lydia, that's how they were successful. Are you going to be talking about that? Yeah, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about a few cases. Okay, because that's, um, that's also being used by the defense team for uh, Barry to the value of the Obama program. Right, yeah. This is, um, these two quotes appeared, even though they're originally from other cases, the, the top quote is from a, it's from a Supreme Court uh, Justice Story wrote that, and and then the middle case is an English case, but they were quoted in a in an important case which I'll talk about in a little while. The case that's cited on the bottom, it's it's a, a leading case. It's known as the Betamax case, and it's where um, it's where the the uh, television studios sued sued Sony and. Um, uh, I'm sorry. That th this is a different case. This this is a. I'm going to talk about this case too. This this is a music. This is a music case. Right. So so the um, the first sentence speaks about the general categories of fair use: criticism, comment, 
news reporting, education, scholarship, and research. Those are not, uh, if, if it's fair use for, for those types of things, and the cases will, will interpret what that means, then, then it's not a copyright infringement. And all the cases I'm going to talk about tonight and, and show, some, uh, show some images from really uh, come down to the same type of legal claim. The, the plaintiff sues for copyright infringement, and the defendant says, I didn't infringe. My, my use was fair use. Go ahead. Um, I was listening to a uh, lecture by someone who wrote a biography of, uh, I think it was uh, Sartre and uh, whoever's lover was. That's another good one. Yeah, that's right. Do, and anyway, so uh, she uh, wrote a biography where she quoted extensively from some of their public, published letters and other material. And the U.S. publisher was able to make use of it, but when she tried to publish it in France, I guess they have different fair use law or different fair use interpretations. Or how, even though we're all signatories to the same, you know, broad copyright uh, agreements worldwide, how much of what you're saying here is unique to the U.S. and how many of these things apply internationally? How many things are recognized, I guess, um, uh, on a broader basis than just the U.S.? The, um I'm speaking solely of, of United States law. The, the, obviously, the internet doesn't have any uh, geographical boundaries, and mo most plaintiffs um, will go after. Right. Does that carry any? Uh, I mean, is there any, is there any significance to that? In other words, um, uh, uh, even though we all agree there's certain things, the countries look at them so differently that, that you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in terms of what you can expect your rights to, to carry this for publishing to are in you know, a more worldwide basis? Well, I think, um, I think that um, from a publication standpoint, you, you need to take whatever steps are, are relevant to wherever the, the uh, publication is occurring. Now, you know, what does that really mean when you're talking about the internet? Um, but you know, it's a, the the issue of of intellectual property protection across across different countries is a is a is a challenging one. You know, without even getting into the whole China discussion. Just curious, how, how does this relate to Digital Millennium Act? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get there. Is, is it, that, but does that replace this? Well, it, the, I was just curious. What the what the Digital Millennium uh, Copyright Act did was there there there's a um, In 1996, there was a there was a um, a treaty that was adopted called the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Uh, it, was, it was an international treaty. Article 11 of that treaty requires nations that participated in that treaty to enact laws against digital rights management circumvention, and and that the the U.S. then in to to follow that. The U.S. two years later developed the digital or adopted the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and and it's really the the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is is really at the core of, of this tension that that exists between uh, between fair use and, and digital rights management. Um, I'd like to talk about the cases first, but what what digital rights management does is it it it's do do most of you know what that term refers to? I mean, it's it's just a it's just a reference to uh, features that that can be put in uh, in either hardware or software to to restrict access or content. Now, the the um, the folks that that employ digital rights management, whether it's in film or or ebooks or uh, or other types of content or media, they're doing so. Under the guise that they're, that they're trying to prevent unlawful copyright infringement, the the problem and, and and the reason it's a hot area, of course, is it's hard to block copyright infringement without also blocking some legitimate fair uses. And and what the Digital Millennium Copyright Act did, it said it made it unlawful to try to get to to develop things to try to get around the the DRM. 
But the problem is to, to enforce that, you're, you're um, eroding fair use. So, so that's the, the sort of core of the, uh, of, of the intellectual issue. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> looking at your list of uh, legal definitions of fair use, I don't see any sort of reference to backup copies. And yet, uh, for any work of any sort that's in digital form, um, making a backup copy in case your original copy gets damaged is considered by many people to be good practice. Right. Uh, is there any legal protection for backup copies? Yeah, ar I, archival copies are are considered okay. Um, this list of four items is, is puts in the law what, what the cases have developed as, as the standard for determining whether fair use exists. The first one, the purpose and character of the use, including its, whether it's a commercial nature. Second, the nature of the copyrighted work. The third being the amount and portion of the, of the copy, of, of the secondary use relative to the original, and the last one being the effect of the secondary use on the potential market or value of, of the original. Um, the first case I'm going to... Go ahead. The comment at the bottom was the fact that a work is unpublished and left part, shall not tell part. What do they consider published versus unpublished? The first, uh, the first so-called public appearance of the work. Yes? Um, so copyrights, is there a validity period like, like for patenting like, uh, the community? Yes, yep. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, um, for a work created after January 1st, 1978, the, uh, the length of the copyright is the author's life plus 70 years. Or if it's a work made for hire, it's the shorter of 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation. And for works that are older than 1978, including renewal rights, lasts for 95 years from publication. So it's a, uh, a lot of these cases are brought by the, uh, by the estates or, or the, you know, some of the more successful Dr. Seuss has a, has a Dr. Seuss Enterprises. Any other questions at this stage? So this was a, th this is a, um, this is a case where uh, a prominent artist named Jeff Coons uh, did the art on the, on the, on your right. In 2000, he was sued by a fashion photographer who, uh, right about the, it wasn't very old, had, had done this photograph on the left called Silk Sandals by Gucci. It appeared in a Allure magazine. The artist won, the, uh, the Coons, Coons won this case. Uh, the court, looking at that first um, factor, the purpose and character of the use, has, has developed what's called the transformative uh, test. That does the use help fulfill a purpose of stimulating creativity for the general public, or does it only supersede the use of the original work for personal profit, profit aims? Uh, the court said that the two artists had ascribed very different purposes and meanings to the photograph. Kuhn's goal was to use a fashion photograph from a glossy magazine to comment on society. And therefore, they concluded his use was transformative. And they found fair use. Um, this factor, the transformative use, also looks at whether the, considers the commercial nature of the use and the justification for copying and whether there's bad faith. Kuhn's ended up selling the, the piece of art on your right to the Guggenheim for two million dollars but the court discounted the commercial nature said the use was transformative and created value that benefited the broader public interest the fact that he didn't seek the um, permission 
of the um, of the photographer w was discounted, that that can sometimes be a factor in in whether there's a fair use finding. Yes. Oh yeah. He. Yeah. In a close case, disclaimer or, or a copyright notice as the original work can help on the bad faith issue, but it's not dispositive. This was also a similar situation where the, the original copyright works were photographs. Um, the, um, the artist Richard Prince won, won this case too. The picture on the top, it's not a great uh, image. But again, the, the artist that the, this, this type of art that Coons does and Prince does is, is called uh, uh, at, attribution art. And they, and they admittedly start with, uh, with images that are already out there. So what does it mean if you do ask permission? Well, uh, I'm going to talk about a case later on in, in music that that um, that you were familiar with, a uh, Roy Orbison song, and the rap group went sought permission. The uh, the company that had the rights to the Roy Orbison song, Pretty Woman, said no. The rap group went ahead and and uh, did their piece anyway. A, a lot of the cases. Um, are are in a parody type situation where where I, I don't know if it rises to the level of the performance that's going to be this Friday uh, that that Bill is in, but I don't think that's Okay. What if it is a parody? Because um, uh, I'm a photographer. And um, recently, uh, a woman uh, in another state uh, wrote a very nice uh, letter. She was in a, a photo that I got on my website. She wanted to make a painting based on it, which she wanted to sell it for the gallery. And she asked my permission, and I gave her the permission. But she had, and it was a perfectly representational painting. It wasn't anything erotic about it or anything. Um, uh, if she hadn't asked permission, and um, I hadn't given it to her, then she did it. And if for some reason I was upset about that, would that be? Well, the permission, the permission part of it's not, is is not going to be. It, it's going to be a factor right. on on the on the bad faith element. Yeah, but it, if but it's not. not her own, and then I didn't, for some reason, I objected. Is, there, is, the, is somebody making a perfectly representational painting, not a, an exaggerated or abstract or you know a uh, uh, parody kind of painting, but a perfectly representational painting based on somebody else's photograph? Is that fair use, or is that something that might be actionable by the photographer? Or something like that? It would it would be it would be viewed in the context of these four factors. I mean, here's a case that you know most of us probably know about the art, but it's also the subject of a current, of a current, um, a current action. What, what happened was um, Shepard Ferry initiated the action. There's a, there's a process in the courts called a declaratory judgment where you, there's not really a current dispute, but you, you think there may be, and, and so you ask the court to, to make a conclusion in this instance that, that Ferry's use of, of the original photograph is fair use. Now the Associated Press has, has responded to that declaratory judgment action by a counterclaim for copyright infringement. Uh, you know, if Ferry presumably recognized the commercial potential of of, of his poster, and, and so he initiated the action, whether if he had just gone ahead, forget about permission, if he had just gone ahead and, uh, and done the poster, you know, who knows whether the Associated Press would have sued him for copyright infringement. He wanted to sort of put the issue to bed. Um, one of the factual things that's interesting about this case, I don't know if any of you have been reading of, about it, but the, uh, the photographer uh, was a, was a uh, part-time, it, it's unclear whether he was an employee or, or a contractor, but the photographer is delighted with, 
with the uh, with the poster and the use that Ferry has made. He he doesn't have any issues whatsoever, but he doesn't own the copyright. The, the Associated Press owns it, so the photographer's view is not really relevant. Now on my blog, I was a member of a group of dissident journalists who were trying to unseat Ken Lewis, the CEO of Bank of America, and the recently, and I made a piece of art based on the Shepard Ferry thing when it's Ken Lewis and he says no. Um, uh, if, if he, if Barry loses, am I in trouble? In other words, those of us who they, they derive works based on uh, uh, Barry's work, uh, uh, if he didn't have the right to them, we presumably are also going to be exposed. It depends on whether, it, it, it depends on how close, what, what the similarities are yeah, between your... Europe. Made to be a derivative work. But was it po was it poking fun at, at the fairy work or more no, Ken Lewis? No, I'm just taking advantage of the fact that everybody recognizes these posters, so it's making an issue because it's making fun of Ken Lewis. It's an attempt to, it's just a way. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting about this case, and and hopefully this happens in a lot of areas of the law, but particularly in fair use, it, it is known by the courts to be flexible, meaning what what may have been deemed. Uh, an infringement 20 years ago wouldn't necessarily be deemed an infringement today because the courts adopt to, uh, to more, more modern uh, views of, of what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Um, but this case has not yet been decided. When, when you see some of the other examples I put up, you, I think you'll conclude, I, I at least did, that uh, if this case, if, if this particular dispute had, had occurred 15 or 20 years ago. And I don't, who knows which way they'll come out now, but I think you'd find from some of the other things that I'll show that if, if 15 or 20 years ago they would have found for, for the Associated Press, who, who knows what they'll find now. Wasn't there a very similar case where a painting of Jimmy Carter on either Time or Newsweek was based on a photograph of Jimmy Carter on the film? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but I, I think that's you know. The original one in well, that's a different issue. What some of the blogs and the legal scholars on this case were a little bit intrigued by the notion of as between the Associated Press and the photographer, who is the owner. That, I'm not really going to talk about it tonight, but I can talk. I can talk one on one afterwards. One of the ways I, I quickly glossed over it in the in the summary of copyright. One of the one of the um, copyright is with the author, unless unless it was a custom work or or a so-called work for hire. Now the law says that if you do something as an employee, your employer owns it in the context of your employment. There doesn't have to be anything in writing. But if you're an independent contractor, as opposed to an employee, uh, you own it. The contractor owns it, unless there's something in writing that says it's a work for hire. Now, is, is Seth here tonight? Um, c can I talk about your situation a little bit? S Seth is an indexer. and. He, he indicates that the common uh, practice in indexing between the contractors and, and the companies that hire them are to often not have something in writing. So, you know, there might be, certainly there's an understanding on the price and hopefully they usually get paid and they hand over their work product, but those, those hiring companies do not own the copyright if, if the work product is copyrightable unless there's something in writing. Now, it's sometimes just because the hiring company and, and, and the worker both say and say it in writing, you're a contractor. As, as Microsoft has gotten into trouble, Fidelity's probably challenged. The IRS has gone after a lot of large companies who try to manage their, their uh, staffing expenses by having more contractors and less employees, but the IRS has a whole, it's not for tonight, but there's a whole um, significant 12-factor test which, set, which looks at whether somebody is truly a, an employee or a contractor. 
Um, but you know, I've run into it in my practice a lot. A lot of small companies hire contractors, and unless there's something in writing that specifically says the work product is a work for hire, the the copyright and other rights, trademark, anything, stay with the uh, with, with the author. They, and and uh, it, it's an easy way to, to trip. Um, so I think I think if you if if you read about this case, my 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 speculation is the issue you're talking about is is whether um, the relationship between the photographer and and Associated Press was was uh, a true work for hire, and if it was, was there something in writing, or or. On the UR, it sounded like the photographer was trying to also get money from there. Not, not in the writings I've read. I, I mean, a lot of the um, a lot of the cases in, involve parody. Uh, th this this is a uh, this is by an artist named Tom Forsythe. He, he did a bunch of works that little uh, I don't know if we can call them sculptures or. Uh, but three-dimensional works that that use Barbie as a as a subject. This particular series was called Food Chain Barbie. So M Mattel, if, if they own the uh, the Barbie copyright uh, or or whoever owned it, sued Forsyth, and uh, and the court found that this was legitimate fair use. Uh, the quote that I've that I've uh, put on the bottom he. He didn't. He said this in the context of the litigation, not not when he produced the art. So the, this concept, effective par parity, is fair use. Uh, less protection in terms of how much the extent of copying is 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 uh, is given to so-called satire to to be distinguished from uh, from parody. Of course, what I just said, when we talk about some of the other examples, there, there's some people who feel that that's a distinction that d doesn't really hold up in the, um, in, in the cases. A parody uses a work in order to poke fun at or comment on the work itself, but a satire uses a work to poke fun at or comment on something else. So at, at least from the statement at the bottom, he was he was using Barbie to, to poke fun at, a, at, at our culture, but presumably Barbie as well, and what, and what Barbie represented. Yes? Point of curiosity. No way was Forsyth making copies of the Barbie doll. He was buying copies in a store, which he then owned, not the copyright, but the copy itself and taking that object and sticking it into a work of art. That's a, How is that a copyright infringement under any? No, that's a good, that, that's a good point. And I've not, I've, not, uh, I've not focused on that, on that aspect of it. But I think the, the, um, I think the argument would be, nobody disputes that he owns the physical copy that he bought. But he didn't, by purchasing that, as I talked about at the beginning, he didn't, acquire, absent something else with, with Mattel, he didn't acquire any copyrights in that. And one of the, one of the exclusive rights that goes with, with uh, the holder of the copyright is the ability to display publicly. And as soon as he incorporated in the art and, and showed his art, he was displaying it publicly. Well, that's the question. I mean, you, that, that's a good point. I mean, the, the the transformative factor. He, he said it's really a derivative work. The the transformative factor, which I think is in some of these cases it's the most important of the four factors. What it's really you're, that's really that issue. Is, is it a mere derivative or is it transformative? If it's transformative, it's fair use. If it's mere derivative, you're you're exercising one of the exclusive rights that stays with the copyright holder. I'm thinking you remember, right, there was the Cabbage Patch doll. There was the craze with those. And then shortly thereafter, there came a series of Garbage Patch Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't use that as one of my illustrations, but, but I've read about that. Uh, 
So here, so here's an interesting situation. Okay. Um, now let me first tell you where the court came out, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. I, I don't remember this. I only came across this in in preparing for tonight. But um, after the OJ trial, you know, a couple authors using the Dr. Seuss style came out with a book, um, the Cat Not in the Hat. Anyway, th this court found copyright infringement. They, they found in favor of Dr. Seuss. Um, they said that they sued public Penguin Books and the parody fair use failed. Although the cat not in the hat does broadly mimic Dr. Seuss's characteristic style, it does not hold his style up to ridicule. The stanzas have, quote, no critical bearing on the substance or style of the cat in the hat. The author's use of the stovepipe hat, the narrator, Dr. Juice, and the title, quote, to get attention, or maybe even, quote, to avoid the drudgery in working up something fresh. Be because there is no effort to create a transformative work with, quote, new expression, meaning, or message, the infringing work's commercial use further cuts against the fair use defense. Now, um, compare this. I don't know, is anybody, is anybody familiar with this book on the right? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't see a big distinction. But to, now, this is not the, I'm going to talk about some things about the, uh, about the Goodnight Bush um, book in a, in a few minutes. But if the court found against uh, the book authors in the prior one, you know, first impression, and again, this, this, the, uh, the holder of the, of the copyright on the, on the children's classic has not, has not sued. Um, but some legal commentators have said this, this parody satire distinction is, is, you know, sort of hogwash. Wait, what did you say? The court No, some of the legal, th this is a hot area, as you could imagine, for, for bloggers and, and uh, law school professors. And, and some of these commentators have said, you, you know, this distinction that I was talking about of, of a um, true, par true parody use is fair use, but, but satire use, where, where the subject of the, um, of the poking of fun is not the original work itself, but it's something else. They're just using it to illustrate. And that's not fair use. There, these uh, commentators have said that that's a distinction that doesn't really hold up. Every par on this point, every parody makes a point independent of the ridicule of the original, and every satire recognizes requires recognition of the original to accomplish its artistic intent. Here's Jeff Koons again. Now this is an older case. He found a, he found a postcard of, of the photograph on the left at a, at a little tourist shop. And Koons was, a, Koons was one of these artists, apparently, like, um, like Andy Warhol, where he, when he had ideas, he went back to his, to his gallery or his, or his uh, his industrial space, and he would, and he would have a whole slew of assistants create, create the, uh, the work that he envisioned in his head. So this case, um, Kuhn's lost. They, he, he openly, he didn't get permission, he didn't seek permission. He openly acknowledged that he used the, the photo. He, he was, um, he and his gallery were putting together a show called ba Banality Show. And this was a work that they produced. Um, the court said on, on this parody use that the original photograph copied was not the subject of the parody. 
they, they were trying to, uh, um, he, could, he could have constructed his parody of, that, of this general type of art, but banality, without copying the specific work. He did change, and, and the, the court did acknowledge that he, he made the puppies blue, he exaggerated their noses, and he added flowers to the hair of the people. This was also a commercial success. success. He sold three of them for $367,000. What happens when the court's finding in his favor? I mean, against him, does the, does the money go to the, to Art Rogers? Well, it would go, in this one, the artist, the artist um, won the uh, one. In a lot of these cases, they, they end up settling. First they appeal. And, and then, and then there's a settlement where sometimes they uh, they they give a uh, an undisclosed amount of money to to a charity or or to something. So you said the artist. Art Roger. No. Oh, right. Infring so infringement. Yeah. Infringement was found. I'm sorry. Oh, if I right. said the. So did the money from the sale so of the sculptures go to Art Roger? Yeah, I think so. Oh, good. I know, you said the artist, and we didn't know which one to So, so this is an example. This case, this case was finally um, resolved in 1992. You know, and, and as I look at this, and then I look at this, you know, if this, to my mind, it's hard to say whether the uh, poster on the right is much more transformative than a, uh, but this one, than the sculpture. But this one is ridiculed the first one by calling it the finale, and the fairy one doesn't appear to do it. Well, I think I, I think the point, the the reason I've put this back up is just to illustrate the point that um, the courts are flexible. You, you, you know what what one year may have been considered a copyright infringement, fifteen years later might not. Yes. When you say the court. What kind of municipality are you saying? What's the court? Well, copyright infringement is brought in federal court. Oh, it's federal? Yeah. And then these cases typically go up to appeal, and then the, the Supreme Court often. What are the state differences in federal and copyright Well, copyright law is, is, is federal. Aren't there state-level variations within that law? Uh, there's, there's districts, th different districts of within the federal scheme and and the districts can have different can have different uh, uh, interpretations now the second factor uh, the nature of the copyrighted work the um, the best way to illustrate this is if, if there's um if the original work was was uh, published facts or information which which benefit the public more leeway is given to copy from the factual works, like, like biographies, than would be given for fictional works, like plays or novels. The, the other um, important concept under the second factor is um, if the work, if the original work has never been published, the courts, th this cuts for a more narrow uh, scope of fair use because the courts acknowledge that, there was a question earlier about what's publication. The courts acknowledge that the first uh, publication of, of a work is a, is a very important and strong aspect of copyright law. This is the image that I've chosen to uh, talk about this second factor. This is, the, uh, this is a picture from the so-called Zapruder film of, of the, uh, every, everybody, this is probably common knowledge, some of the the, the best police indication of trying to recreate what happened in, at the Kennedy assassination was from a, from a home, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a video camera, at, at, in 63, just, just, yeah. So he went and he developed the, the film that night and, and he sold it a couple days later to, to Time Magazine. Uh, this particular litigation involved, a couple years later there was a, there, there was a, um, a book that came out that was called Six Seconds in Dallas. And, and Time, that owned, Time Magazine owned the copyright 
on the photo in this book used stills from, from this film. And, and Time sued the publisher and the distributor of the book. And the court found fair use. They, they said the nature of the copyrighted work was such that it, 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 was, uh, it was too strong in the, in the public interest to, to prevent publication for, for uh, a, a book of this type. Now, if the, the um, there are some cases, if, if, the, if the original had never appeared publicly, it's possible that, that this case would have turned out differently. Because again, the courts say that uh, the so-called first public appearance or the first publication of, of the original work is, a, is an extremely important aspect of copyright law. The third factor, the amount and substantiality of the portion taken from the copyrighted work in, in, the, second, in, the, in, in the second use, this, this um, example is cited for, for illustrative of this factor. Here, the, the court um, said they, they, just used the, they just used the legs. They didn't use the context in which this photo was taken. It's, I, I can't see it, but the court said it was taken on the, the, the legs, the woman's legs are on a, on a man's uh, lap and he's, he's sitting on an airplane. The less taken, the better the chance copying will be considered fair use, the less taken from the original. Now, there's a, there's a few important exceptions to this, the less taken the better chance it'll be considered fair use. This, the, the best illustration of this exception is, is the so-called Betamax case. It's one of the more important cases uh, in this whole fair use issue. This was a 1984 case. The Supreme Court found that copying entire television shows for purposes of watching them at more convenient times, what the court called time shifting, that that was fair use. What happened was, um, as I said earlier, uh, Universal Studios, the uh, television um, producer, sued, sued Sony Corp. Sony was a manufacturer of VCRs or Betamaxes. And the theory was that because the intended use of, of, these, uh, of these electronic uh, gadgets was for copyright infringement, that, that the consumer, the ultimate consumer would be copying the television show and, and, uh, and watching it at his own time, they, they tried to hold the, the VCR makers liable under a so-called contributory infringement uh, theory. This case is also a good illustration of how fair use has to adopt to, to new technologies. Um, and although it's not directly relevant to the internet and what, what we're finding now, the fact that fair use has, has, has uh, migrated over time, it is very relevant today to, to new technologies. Um, the court said it might be able to be used by some consumers in, in, a, in a way that is copyright infringement, but the fact that it can also be used for, for legitimate uh, private uses makes, makes it uh, fair use. As it turned out, the, uh, this case was very important both for the electronics industry and ultimately for the, uh, for the copyright owners, the, the, uh, the film studios that had all those old films because it, it, it resulted in a huge uh, market that hadn't existed before of, of uh, selling pre-recorded movies. Now, an another case that's, that's uh, a little more internet related, is, is a, a record company sued Napster in 2001, uh, also on this contributory infringement um, claim. It was the first case that addressed, it, addressed the application of copyright laws to peer-to-peer to -peer file sharing. Napster claimed that its users were in fact engaged in three kinds of fair use. One was called sampling, where the users made temporary copies of a work before purchasing it, space shifting, 
where users access a sound recording through the Napster system, a sound recording that they already own in audio CD format. The court compared the, uh, the, 80, the 1984 Betamax case. They said the VCR manufacturers had no control over how their buyers use the, uh, the VCRs, but the Napster court found that Napster could control the infringing behavior of its users, and therefore they had a duty to do so. So Napster lost that case. Permissive distribution of recordings by both new and established artists. But they lost on. You know, the uh, RIA has been suing all kinds of uh, people who've been using peer to peer file sharing to distribute you know, music that they felt like they had some reason for that. Um, and uh, most of the time, it's just the distribution that they cite. There's a case in Texas, uh, I don't remember, there's a case in Iraq for recording in Texas last year where the RIA, RIA in addition to the distribution, also. Uh, cited the, um, the fact that the person who did the distributing uh, started the CDs of the music and you know, first converted them to MP3 with the apparent allegation that that was also actionable. That's something that almost all of us do when we're putting our music on our iPods, for example. Do you, have you heard anything about how that's progressed? Is that going to become a uh, uh, factor with regard to the fairness of uh, uh, music? You know, the, Right now, we all assume if I buy CD and I want to hear it on my iPod, I can just rip it down to three and play it on my iPod. None of us think we're doing anything wrong. Do you know if that's about to become an issue? Uh, well, this case, you know, well, private. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, but, but private use is, is generally protected. Has that been found anywhere, or that's just in nobody's complaint, nobody's brought in cases? So I just want to say two things quickly about, the, uh, about this factor of the size of the use of the original. Um, in music, this, this sampling standard doesn't, isn't typically allowed. The, there, there's a court case that involved um, the bands NWA and Funkadelic from 2005. The um, NWA in their song 100 Miles and Runnin' used a two second guitar chord from Funkadelic's Get Off Your Ass and Jam and lowered the pitch and looped it five times in their song. They didn't get permission and no compensation was paid. The court said using any section of a recorded music work, regardless of length, would be a copyright violation without permission. In its decision, the court wrote, get a license or do not sample. We do not see this as stifling creativity in any significant way. And then there's some other cases that talk about use of, of posters or, or, um, or uh, photos in the background of television shows or movies, and they, and they look at such things as how long was it? Was, was it really recognizable? And, and uh, if, if it was recognizable and it, and it was uh, more than just uh, extremely quick, they, they, they do find uh, infringement in those cases. Now, another, another area where you're allowed to use a little more of the original is, is, in, the par is in the parody area because they say that in order to be effective parody, you have to, quote, conjure up the, the original. So that's another area where it's OK to use a little bit more of, of the original. Now, I want to talk, the fourth factor is called the effect of the use on the potential market of the original work. How has the, the second user's use altered the copyright owner's ability to exploit the original work? Does the use in question act as a direct market substitute for the original work? What, one example from a 2003 case, the, um, somebody made unauthorized movie trailers for video retailers 
since, since the trailers acted as a direct substitute for the copyright owner's official trailers, uh, copyright infringement was found. Another area that, that there's been a case on in this is in, in college towns, there's, there's a market for what's called course packs of, of student materials. Um, the case found that um, if you involved a commercial copy shop, a Kinko's, uh, to, to make copies, if, if a professor went to a Kinko's and had them aggregate and, and passed everything out, that would be considered infringement. If, on the other hand, the, the professor on his home machine you know, made, made some copies for students, that, that would be fair use. Um, what I wanted to talk about now with, on, in this context with regard to this, this, uh, this book, the Goodnight Bush book, is Little Brown was the publisher. And, and they did some things in this book that the legal scholars think were designed. And again, there has not been any litigation on this. The, uh, the, class, the owner of the classic has not sued. But w what they did, they included disclaimers on the, uh, on the front and back cover. This book is a parody and has not been prepared, authorized, or, or approved by the creators of Goodnight Moon. Um, but, but on this issue of is it a substitute for the original? Now, now obviously, this is a children's book. Parents buy it. Goodnight Bush, they have a couple pages where they have some stuffed animals, don donkeys, and elephants, and they show them in, in humping positions. Uh, they, they also have, they also have um, there, there's a sequence through the book of, of uh, President Bush on, on a number of pages showing him getting ready to s for sleep in his bedroom. Uh, as the story progresses, has anybody seen this book? As the story progresses, he's in the same room with minor detail orient alterations. The first time they show this image, there's five lines of cocaine on his nightstand. At, in, subsequent, in subsequent images, each time they go back to that same scene, there's one less line until on the third to last page, there, there's no, they're all gone. And, and the, the uh, text says, good night failures everywhere. And, and actually, the, uh, these two examples of, of uh, content, which is inappropriate for kids, have been suggested to be a pretty good effort by Little Brown to, to avoid a successful copyright infringement case. Because clearly, these, um, the, the choice of using these images it, it would be hard to argue that uh, it's it's taking away from the from the market of, of the as a children's book of, of the original. But again, there's there's no there's there's no lawsuit pending. So the less likely Goodnight Bush is to act as a market substitute for Goodnight Moon, the more likely it would be to f that it'd be shielded from liability un under under fair use. Now I have a. I have some trouble trying to, from the legal side, trying to see how an outcome of this type of case would be different from, um, from the, um, the Dr. Seuss book case, you know, which sound, found infringement. And maybe the way to look at that distinction is um, it's just a reflection of how the courts have evolved. So this, this case is called Campbell versus A Cuff Rose Music. And that, that's the company that owned the, uh, the copyright on the Ray Orbison song. <laughs> so two live crews sought permission. Their manager went to the holder of the Ray Orbison song and said, we want to use your song. Can you give us permission? They said no. They they went ahead and uh, and and created their own rap song. I, I didn't I didn't give you an image of the lyrics. They're they're pretty racy. Now two live crew won this case. Even though it was satire, 
they, they did say that they thought that it, it mocked the earlier song. Uh, they concluded that the use was transformative. studio won this case. <laughs> well, they, they said that they said that it was it was it was parody. The subject matter of, of the promotional movie poster was really the original the original photo. The the um, plaintiff was the photographer. She continued to own the rights. They looked, the court looked at the, the composition of the uh, Leslie Nielsen poster, said that it was clearly parody, the smirk on his face, the different light. Um, Demi Moore's, the, the ring Leslie Nielsen's wearing is, uh, is exaggerated. The artistic choices, the difference in the light. They called Demi Moore's face expression Harkening back to the classical Venus Paducah pose, while Nielsen's face bears a smirk, quote, disrupting serious appreciation. <laughs> so the, the image on the left is a pretty famous uh, drawing by Saul Steinberg, the, the world, the, the view of the US or the world from the New York City residents standpoint. Then there was a, another movie poster that came out a few years later to uh, promote a movie, Robin Williams' movie called Moscow on the Hudson. The uh, copyright infringement was found in this case. They said that they just, the Moscow on the Hudson movie poster did not create a parody. It simply borrowed the New Yorker's parody. That is the the New York City residents' geographical viewpoint that New York City is the center of the world. This is a book that came out in 2001. It borrowed a bunch of ideas from the um, from Gone with the Wind, but it was told from the from the slaves' uh, standpoint rather than the slave owners. The court found effective parody, fair use. This is a recent case. I didn't, I didn't, uh, the, my tech guy at the office said he couldn't reproduce the YouTube video, but this was a, a prominent case that just came out in, I think last summer. A, a, uh, a mother from Pennsylvania uh, filmed her 13-month-old singing to a, to a Prince song called Let's Go Crazy. Uh, Prince apparently is extremely vigilant about the use of his songs, and he brought it to the attention of his of his uh, of whoever owns the rights to his song. So what happened? This is an example of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, Prince or his publisher sued uh, Google, which of course owns YouTube, and they they first sent. I'm sorry, they 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 didn't sue. They they sent what's called a takedown notice. D does any is anybody familiar with how the Digital Millennium Copyright Act works? It's, it's intended to be a, a, among its provisions, in, in addition to it, it being adopted to, to put into law that you can't, um, you can't uh, try to develop ways to go around uh, DRM systems if, if the intent is to infringe copyrights. It also provided some safe, har some so-called safe harbor provisions for, for internet service providers or, or online service providers, and the way these provisions work is when a copyright holder feels there's a use that's infringing, they send what's come to be known as a takedown notice to to YouTube, and say, and, and have to say in writing, 
we, we in good faith, say that, uh, that there's this use that's being, that, that your system is being used for uh, an infringing use. And, and Google or YouTube then has to send a notice to, to the alleged infringing user. In this instance, this, this woman that had posted a, a, home, a 29 second home video of, of uh, her 13 month old dancing to the Prince song. And, uh, and so, so YouTube has to send notice that they got this takedown notice to the, to the uh, infringer. The infringer can send a, a response notice, a dispute notice, and say, this is in good faith, fair use. The, the independent service provider, YouTube, under the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act, has, has um, if, if they get that, if, if they get that counter notice from, from the alleged infringer, they have to send a copy to the alleged copyright holder, Prince or, or his music publisher, and within 14 days, they're supposed to put the, uh, the secondary use back up unless they get notice that a, uh, that a copyright infringement action has been initiated in, in that 14 day period. And that, what I've generally described is what's called the safe harbor provisions of, of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. What, what they're trying to do is, among other things, is they're trying to get the YouTubes or, or the, the, uh, the party in the middle to not have to make a decision on, on who's right under the law, but to just, to just follow a certain process. And hopefully most of the uh, disputes will get resolved without there being a lawsuit. What happened here was um, YouTube waited six weeks to, to repost, to put this back up. And, and uh, the, the mom from Pennsylvania, with the help of, of a, uh, I think, a, a group that's associated with Stanford, which is, as you could imagine, one of the uh, hotter areas for, for this whole fair use because of in, the, in the Silicon Valley, uh, has sued uh, has sued Prince's publisher or Prince, and and also uh, Google for for her legal fees, and and it's not a big issue that they waited six weeks rather than fourteen days, but w what you're finding with all of these cases like this one, and and there's a very big one now that's that's uh, been initiated that's just in the discovery stage, it's it's Viacom is, is has sued Google for 160,000 different images that they said have been used, one point, have been viewed 1.5 billion times. They're, they're suing Google. And it's the same theory as, as what was used in the Betamax case and in that Napster case, the so-called contributory infringement case. They're, they're saying, Google, you provided, or YouTube, you provided the devices that have allowed third parties, the public, to, to use images and, and, and works that we own as copyright holders. And, and therefore, you're, you are committing com contributory infringement. A lot of people think the Viacom versus, versus Google case will settle. It was also a large case that was settled that some of you may be familiar with. It was brought by the Artists Guild against uh, against Google, and, and, and that was settled. And, and the idea was that the Google project by which they're digitizing certain university libraries, the, the Artist Guild sued and said, this is Google, you're, you're committing a contributory infringement here. And, and that one settled, and it involves funding. Any artist can opt out without giving permission. It also involves uh, a splitting of the revenue you know, that's derived. So anyway, that's the, I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Um, so digital rights, digital rights management falls into this whole, uh, this whole background of, of, of this fair use. What's fair use? What's, what's, um, what's copyright infringement? And, and digital rights management is, is really the, uh, the current uh, efforts of, of music companies, uh, software providers, people that are in the 
companies that are in the e-book space. It's, it just represents their efforts of trying to, uh, to control the, the, the access. Microsoft is, is very significant in this space. Um, and there's just an inherent tension in the, in, the, uh, in, in the law because digital rights management, ad admittedly, is, is an effort by, by copyright uh, owners to, to control access content. In the music area, it's, it's, uh, it's often ends up in the, in the direction of the, the marketplace uh, prevailing be, because, and, and a lot of the big players in that area have, have ultimately dropped all of their DRM so, so that a lot, of, uh, a lot of internet music is accessible with, without DRM, but it's still subject to their own, to their own uh, systems and isn't interoperable with, with other systems. Um, some people think that in, in the whole e-books area, the, the reason that it hasn't, it's perceived right now as a marketing failure is that, that uh, Microsoft and others are insisting on, on uh, u using uh, digital rights management. The, uh, the fair use proponents actually think DRM is a misnomer, that it shouldn't be called digital rights management, it should be called a digital restriction digital restriction management. Yes? I know that in at least one case, fairly famous, Sony, as part of their DRM, installed root kits on people's computers. Yes, yeah. Is there any sense of liability on the part of the DRM manufacturers for either damage to users, machines, or restrictions? Is there any liability? Yeah, absolutely. In, in, in the Sony case that you're talking about, there, there was actually um, a number of class action lawsuits which, which involved very large settlements, pl plus uh, both cash payouts and, and free album downloads. What, what happened, you're, you're familiar with it, what happened was the, uh, the, the software was uh, surreptitiously would be installed on the user's uh, computers, and it, and it had a rootkit that, that ended up, uh, that created a severe security vulnerability that others could exploit. Anyway, I'll just, the, the final slide is just, uh, again, goes to the public policy. Oliver Holmes, who I think is from Massachusetts, parody. The court should not evaluate whether a parody is in good taste or bad. And then that, that second quote, I think, is particularly uh, interesting in the fair use context. It's from 1903, but it, that last sentence. So I've run over. I apologize. I had wanted to give a few more examples of where in music and film and, and uh, in e-books digital rights management is, but it's a, it's, a, it's a hot area because it inherently by definition involves uh, this, this um, continuing struggle and tension between a legitimate protection of copyright owner's rights and, and at the same time the, the fair use, fair use uh, legitimate fair use rights.